Welcome to Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that explores human dynamics and behavior. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We talk with researchers and other interesting people to unlock the mysteries of our behavior by using a behavioral science lens. By now, Tim and I expect that you've already checked out our five-part series on the history of behavioral economics called They Thought We Were Ridiculous. And you probably decided that you love it. And you've probably shared it on social media. And you've probably looking in the mirror every morning and going, wow, I am smarter and look great because I listened to all five episodes of They Thought We Were Ridiculous. Um, well, Kurt, I, I'm not so sure about all those claims. It's possible, what? It's possible that at least some of our listeners who actually have checked out all five episodes of They Thought We Were Ridiculous haven't actually shared it on social media. So hashtag just saying. Uh, <laughs> you might be right. All you those other right. things could be are more likely to be true, but oh, uh, yeah, I know. I mean, every morning <laughs> looking in the mirror, going, "I am smarter and better looking because I listened to <laughs> this podcast series." There you go. All right, folks. If if you haven't listened to the series and haven't shared it, you should join those who already have, and you could just saying write a teeny tiny little post about how it helped you get a promotion, or how it helped you become a better parent or improved your grades or something like that. I, I got to say, I love your optimism, man. I really yeah, do. Well, <laughs> you know, thanks. We might as well be optimistic. At the time of this recording, uh, when we're recording this introduction, the series hasn't even dropped right, yet. Right. So, so we can be optimistic all we want because we're just guessing. That's all I'm saying. We're just guessing at this point. And Damn it, we're guessing high. We are a little out of order on this. Um, the important thing that we want you to take away from this is to check out all five episodes because each one has something fun and interesting to offer. So if you have not yet teed up the series on They Thought We Were Ridiculous, please put it in your queue and let someone you care about know about it too. Right, agreed. And and I can probably say that this is the last time that we will be promoting this. Uh, <laughs> probably, so, yes. <laughs> so just do it now because you won't get this wonderful banter back and forth between Tim and me about, <laughs> you know, they thought we were ridiculous anymore. So, yeah, true. okay, we should probably turn to the guest who's featured in this episode. What do you think, Tim? That sounds good. Okay, so this episode features a wonderful conversation with Dr. Julia DeGangi, and that's pronounced with a full-out Chicago accent on the Gangi part, by the way. Um, Did yeah. you say it with a full? I mean, you didn't do the Gangi, you know, the, the Chicago accent. Julia DeGangi. There you go. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dr. DeGangi is a <laughs> neuropsychologist who trained at Harvard Medical School, Boston University School of Medicine, and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Her focus for the past two decades has been on the connection between our brains and our behavior, with particular emphasis in the areas of stress, trauma, and resilience. Yeah, we wanted to speak with Dr. Julia because she is the author of a new book, Energy Rising, The Neuroscience of Leading with Emotional Power. She wrote the book after years of working with leaders at the White House Press Office, global corporations, international NGOs, and U.S. Special Forces. This variety in her clinical work makes her book even more interesting and more relevant to a broader audience. Julia shows us whether you're at work or at home, you can harness the power of your brain to lead a more satisfying and emotionally intelligent life. Our conversation with her covers several important concepts. The first of which is that dealing with our emotions is probably the greatest challenge that human beings encounter on a daily basis. We are fundamentally emotional beings and Julia deconstructs the way we process emotions with a neuroscience lens. Now, she also talks about what emotions are, and she describes energy from a neurobiological perspective as well. We talk about the importance of facing our emotional pain for personal growth, and she brought up an interesting analogy on physical and emotional health as a way to describe the importance of our emotional power and resilience. Lastly, we address the relationship between anxiety and uncertainty which is a topic that Kurt and I sort of fell in love with back when we first spoke with Nathan and Susanna Fur in episode 345. 
This is dynamite stuff. And we hope you check out every word that Julia shares with us. And speaking of every word, Tim, she had some great one-liners, and I can't resist sharing a couple right now, like okay. uh, how we're, quote, chronically missing the off-ramps that can keep us mentally and emotionally healthy, or how we can have a disturbed relationship with certainty. She even goes so far as to say that the brain has an allergy for uncertainty. <sighs> Mm, really good stuff. Yeah, major winners, totally. Yeah, it's a terrific conversation. And we hope that right now you can sit back and relax with a stiff pour of emotional power and enjoy our conversation with Dr. Julia DeGangi. Dr. Julia DeGangi, welcome to Behavioral Groups. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Tim and Kurt. We are excited to have you here. And the first thing, maybe the most important thing we'll talk about all day is do you prefer coffee or tea? Oh my God. I thought you were going to ask me an easier one. So <laughs> I adore both. Is it a total cop out to say secret option C? So I'm, oh. I have, I always have not just one, but multiple cups of coffee on my desk at once. You probably can't see that in the, in the video, but I have multiple cups of coffee. But I am a hobbyist forager. And so I am actually starting a mini apothecary. And so I love, I love teas. Oh my. I'm growing, I'm growing lemon balm in my basement. I grew yarrow. I have cinnamon. I have licorice. So it's, I have little kids. And it's been really cool to get into the tea. So oh. I would say I would prefer coffee on a day-to-day basis, but I love the energy and the vibe of tea. Okay. Okay. So I will have to tell you that you are the, we've had multiple people who say, oh, I do coffee in the morning, tea in the afternoon, or I like yeah. both. Depends yeah. on the, my mood. We have not had anybody who talks about like making you know, their own gro- tea, growing their yeah. own components for their tea. It's this so is cool. fantastic. It's so cool. One of the things that we did this summer, am I taking too long? No, on this, this is, this is okay. how okay. We, we call it a speed round that is, is never. I, know, I, I knew that. And I was like, wait, this doesn't feel that speedy. <laughs> it never but, um, is. What was amazing. Have you guys ever heard of dandelion coffee? I have, no. I've heard of dandelion wine, but not coffee. Okay, right. So the dandelion is actually a very versatile thing in the U.S. Like we think they're weeds, but they're actually incredibly nutritive. So I took my little kids. We found this this person who had a huge yard and they were very generous. They said, we don't spray here and you're welcome to. And so we dug up. We spent, and it's a ton of work. We were like sweating and we dug up a ton <laughs> of dandelions. And then what you do is you take the root, you roast it. And then you, it's called, it's supposed to taste very similar to coffee, which is why they call it dandelion coffee. And then we had a little tea party with, with the dandelion tea. Oh my gosh. Oh, this is the most amazing response that we've ever had to coffee or tea. I I just want to say, I I also have to go back to you. You have more than one cup of coffee on your desk. Yes. So my husband is like, what is wrong with your brain? When I, I am in deep think, I don't know what it is, but I need copious amounts of liquid around me. So honest to God, I was writing something the other, I have one, two, three, four. I have two cups of water and two cups of coffee. I don't know why I do this. There's, there's no good explanation. So, so it's not different types of coffee. Like you have one oh, no, cup no, no, that no. is like, I exactly. nope. And I'm like and... the most basic. Yeah. yeah. I, I, Coffee, like my soul, black and like sometimes cold. Like I'm just very basic when it comes to these things. Um, so just like there's nothing fancy. I just, and I would not call myself lazy either. I just start amassing cups. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. okay. All right. Fantastic. We, we're going on. We have, we're now on, on question number two in our speed <laughs> round. All right. Would you rather have dinner with your favorite musician or your favorite movie star? Ooh, I think... I'd be delighted to have dinner with either. I think that I would have dinner with my favorite. And by, okay, I was, if you, just based on the way you asked the question, I would say my favorite musician. Okay. Okay. I, 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 the idea of sort of the emotionality and the lyricism of music, I would be very curious to talk to them about how, and not that there's not an energy to acting, but I think there's a very special energy in music. So how they kind of connect, you know, as a, as a neuropsychologist that focuses on mo- uh, emotion, I would want to hear about their their relationship with lyrics and emotion and rhythm. 
Interesting. And, and, and as opposed to the kind of emotion that you would get with a, with an actor or, or movie star trying to fill in that role and trying to fit that emotion in. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's like, like I said, I think they'd both be so fascinating, but my instinct goes more to the musician. It's, it's funny. And Tim loves this aspect, but, uh, we asked this question, you know, this and, and coffee and tea are probably our two most, most asked questions in this round. And we find a lot of our guests do the exact same thing. That's like, oh, I really love my favorite actor, or actress, but I think the conversation would just be so much deeper with the musician. There would be so mm-hmm. more to, to talk to in, in that, that case. So and they're it's right. Interesting. And they're and right. They're right. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Okay, Mr. Uh, right. Musician. There you go. You can, you can ask the third question. Well, Dr. Julia, does anyone come to mind? Does any one particular musician come to mind? Just out of curiosity. Yes. Yeah, so two come to mind. So I am a I am a words person. I just wrote, you know, Energy Rising. I'm a writer. So the lyricism of music. So I have I find Don Henley's music to be like poetry. Yeah. And I also find John Mayer, the way that he has has a certain obviously very strong musically, but also there's sort of this depth to his lyrics in a lot of ways. So those are the two that come to mind. Beautifully said. Boy, I gotta also say shout out to my, like uh, all my friends and I, we adored counting crows in high school. Uh-huh. Like that was our sort of ride or die group. So uh, I would, you know, Adam Duritz would have to be on the list too. Okay. Fantastic. We, we, uh, n- next time you're on, we'll spend the entire time talking about Don Henley lyrics because that would be okay. a fantastic. Oh my God. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Yes. Okay. All right. But uh, we are in the speed round. Yeah. We do we need are. to get to this. Is, this is, I feel like I'm failing. <laughs> like this woman did not get the memo. No, you are doing oh, absolutely fair. wonderful. You're, yeah. Uh, truly. Okay. Is our brain, this is a yes or no question, is our brain the most powerful pattern detection machine in the world? Hell yes. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Nailed it. Boom. Yes. <laughs> okay. We, we might have just taken that verbatim from, from we might have. Uh, <laughs> some, something that was written somewhere. I don't know. So uh, Maybe from Energy Rising. Yeah. We will talk about that more as we get into this. But uh, last speed round question. In your opinion, are most people very good at identifying and dealing with their emotional pain? I think it's the most challenging, the most challenging, the singularly most challenging issue on the planet. There is no problem in our lives until there's pain. So in other words, if I lost a job or my husband cheated on me or something happened to a family member and I had no emotion, even if I'm stuck in traffic, if I have no emotion, there is no problem. So I don't know that I would think of it in terms of easy because I think we're all out there, you know, with, with a certain degree of intelligence, but I think it's it's the most challenging. I think dealing with difficult emotions is the single most difficult and challenging problem, if you will, on the planet. I love that take where it's it's not a problem until, you know, you feel that emotional pain. And, and the, the stuck in traffic, I think, is a perfect example. Like there are times where I'm stuck in traffic where I, I could care less. It's it's just, you know, right. this is what it is. It's fine. I, I don't really, it doesn't bother me one bit. And there are other times where it is the most painful experience. Well, not the most painful, a, a very painful experience <laughs> because either I need to get somewhere or there's some other aspect that is just driving at me. And and the response and the pain that you feel is very different, even though the situation itself is the same. It's It's crazy. You're precisely right. And the reason for this is the way the brain makes meaning out of your life is fundamentally governed by what we call affective or or emotional circuits in the brain. There is nothing in your life that has meaning until you have feeling about it. So if you just think about the most powerful questions of your life, right? So are you a good person? I don't know. How do you feel about it? Have you been successful enough? I don't know. How do you feel about it? Do you have enough time? Do you have enough money? Have you done enough? Are you doing too little? All of these questions are fundamentally mediated by emotion. We all have people in our lives who, you know, there's kind of some objective similarities, right? So they live in a very similar type of house, or they make a certain amount of money, or they have specific types of jobs. And we all have these experiences where we know people or, or we know ourselves where one person is incredibly happy 
and the other person is incredibly miserable. Well, what's the difference between those things? And sure, like there's going to be some, nothing is precisely identical on the situational level, but overwhelmingly that difference is mediated by emotion. And so what I'm on fire on this planet to do during my lifetime is help people understand emotional intelligence in a really profound and powerful way, because it's how we make, how we deal with the energy of our emotions that determines our reality. I love the way that you said that because you, you've, you've referred to being on fire a couple of times and uh, listeners can't see you, but you are smoldering. You are absolutely, you are absolutely on fire. And we are, we are so glad to, to be experiencing that, uh, that heat from you today, uh, Dr. Julia. I want to get to the full title of your book is Energy Rising, the Neuroscience of Leading with Emotional Power. So could we just talk a little bit about what emotional power is? If emotions are so critical, what is emotional power? So let me just, that's an awesome question. Let me just kind of zoom out a little bit and say what emotions are first. Great. Okay. So I think a phenomenal, and by the way, I'm going to talk a lot about energy and I, I'm a scientist. I'm very well published in the scientific literature. So when I say energy, I don't mean this metaphorically. I don't mean it metaphysically. I think it's great if you want to think about it in those ways, but I'm talking about energy in a neurobiological way. Okay. So emotions at their most scientific level are these neuroelectrical impulses of energy that communicate to the body and drive our behavior. All right. So we don't have to get into this like very academic language. I think a phenomenal way to think about your emotions is as the Google Maps of your life. Okay. So you have this super powerful neurobiological guidance system that, and so we're like all driving down the road of our life. And our emotions are like, at the next intersection, please get off the ramp and immediately leave this job. At the next intersection, please immediately leave this conversation, leave this. And what are we all doing? We're all like, I call my, my, my GPS on my phone. I call her Jane when she talks to me. We're all like taking our phones and like throwing Jane in the trunk and like zooming past the intersection that she's telling us to get off on. So it's like we are, we have this profound neurobiological guidance system that has evolved through millions of years of evolution. It was intelligent enough to stay on the planet for that long. And then instead of paying attention to our emotions, so many of us are out there avoiding them. Okay. So what we need to understand is that the human biology, the human physicality at, at its fundamental core is just energy. Okay. So we have energetic systems that drive behavior and we have energetic systems that drive emotion. Well, what a lot of us are doing is, and we're starting to feel, we're chronically missing the off ramps, right? Or we're chronically missing the turns. So our emotion is saying to us, hey, you really need to speak up in this situation. You really need to speak up in this relationship. And what are we doing chronically? We're keeping our mouth shut. Our emotions are saying to us chronically, hey, you really need to start saying no more. Like you're exhausted, you're overworked. But then what are we using our the energy of our behavior to do? To overwork, to say yes, right? So in all of these instances, and I can give plenty of others, I think they're going to resonate with people quite clearly. We're dividing the energy of our emotion from the energy of our behavior. Now, there's a very logical consequence of this. Like I talk a lot in my work about this idea of emotional physics or emotional math. I think a lot of us wake up and look at our lives and we're like, God, I'm so confused by how I got here. Like kind of this feeling of meh. Like I just look out the window and this is all there is for another 40, 50, 60 years. Well, the very mathematical consequence, if you have two engines that are driving you through your life, the engine of emotion and the engine of behavior, if you put a, this on a plane or an automobile and you had one engine drive in one direction and the other engine drive in the exact opposite direction, the consequence would be stagnation. Well, what does stagnation feel like in the human emotional system? It feels like stagnation, depletion, exhaustion, and at the extreme, hopelessness and numbness. So emotional power is about having the intelligence to pay attention to our emotions and trust them even when the, because when we get to physical pain, we got to put some sweat in there. I'm sorry, when we get to physical power, right? We got to kind of like work out. So when we get to emotional power, we do need to have a new relationship with our emotions. And in that developing of the new relationship, 
there's going to be there's going to be some difficult feelings. There's going to be some emotional resistance. So a couple things on that, um, Dr. Julia. One, one, you talk about this. We don't trust those emotions. We, we ignore Jane when Jane is telling us to get off at the next exit ramp. Correct. Why? What what is it about the emotional side of things that we we go? Ah, I don't need to listen. I don't I don't I don't need to pay attention to that at this point where where I'm I, 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 you know, what is the, the component around that 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 is driving that that lack of trust? Absolutely. The holy hallucination of every human being on the planet is avoidance of painful emotions. Now, I'm going to talk in our conversation a lot about emotional power and emotional pain. By emotional pain, I mean any feeling that feels bad. So I don't care if you call it anxiety, fear, frustration, irritation, being upset, feeling inadequate, being embarrassed. The brain is the most precious real estate on the planet. It's less than three pounds, okay? So the circuits that give rise to feelings have gotten very efficient, efficient use of the real estate. And so the circuits that give rise to your bad feelings, like anger, anxiety, fear, stress, are the same circuits. We then call them different things based on a variety of factors. But that arousal that comes in the brain and the nervous system, I'm calling emotional pain. So I don't care if we're talking about traumatic pain or I don't care if we're talking about frustration and traffic. Okay. So the holy hallucination of every human being on the planet is I don't want to feel pain. Mm -hmm. Pain is the most neurobiological sign that our survival could be imperiled, that we're at risk, all right? Well, the issue here is that we have got to, the, the brain at a, at a primitive level processes emotional and physical pain very similarly. So for example, if I burn my hand on a hot stove, my, my, hand is, my brain is going to send a signal and immediately yank my hand away. Okay, that's very adaptive. In neuropsychology, we call this one trial learning. You burned me once, I will never again put my hand on that hot stove. Okay, it's similar in the, with the emotional experience of pain. It's like, that doesn't feel good. Let me never do that again. At a primitive level, this makes sense. But the problem is our emotional lives are not primitive. And I want you to think about every single emotional pain that you have in your life. And what I can promise you, is nearly 100% of it is chronic. It's the same conversations, the same frustrating conversations that you're having at your job. It's the same annoying conversations you're having with your child. It's the same maddening situations on social media, right? So the, the difference between physical pain and emotional pain has a lot to do with repetitiveness, chronicity. So the idea to go back to your question is like, well, what, what, why are we kind of avoiding this? It's like, I want to speak up. Well, if I speak up and I'm used to not speaking up, when I go to speak up, it's going to frighten me. It's going to give me anxiety. It's going to scare me. It's going to intimidate me. So what happens is because until we have conversations like these, the, the neurology of the human being is seeking a totally false option, which is the absence of any pain. Yeah. Now, in Energy Rising, I talk about this idea of we have got to pick a more powerful pain. So the idea that there is a pain-free option in our life is patently false. I want to go there because, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you, you talk about this finding a more powerful pain. And one of the most counterintuitive aspects that I took from your book is this idea that you're talking about right now, this idea that, you know, to build on this to to um to to kind of be a, a more full person and to to be able to embrace uh, that emotional power we need to actually face that emotional pain to search for a more powerful pain rather than ignoring that emotional pain so what does that do when you when you look for that more powerful pain or when you turn to face that emotional pain what is that doing for us and why does that as opposed to trying to ignore it, help us? Such a good question. And, and you know, my answer is, is quite literally the premise of Energy Rising. And the premise, so, so why do we do it? This is the answer. And this is why I wrote Energy Rising. Because every single thing, every single thing that we want in this lifetime and don't yet have is on the other side of the feelings we keep avoiding feeling. 
For example, and this, I think this is a moment, if I had one word to describe my work, I would use the word counterintuitive or I would use the word opposite. So a lot of what I'm bringing forth because of how the brain works is counterintuitive, okay? So when we think about the things we most want uh, in our lives, we want things like self-confidence, resilience, peace, connection. Here, here's, the, here's the counterintuitive drop. These things hurt. If it was easy to be confident, everyone on the planet would be easy. If it was easy to be courageous or hold our integrity or be honest, everyone would be these things. So we break down at the moment of what? There's this tendency to start talking about situation. Well, these people said this, or that person's going to do this, or you don't know my husband, or you don't know my wife, or you don't know. And I, listen, I say this all the time. I do a lot of work with leaders and I do a lot of work with patients. So I, I have a, I, and I was called to this work, I think, because I'm very empathic and compassionate. I have never heard a bad excuse. Truly. The things that we have to deal with in, in, the, in these human lives are incredibly intense. And yet still, the question about emotional power is not how do I become powerful after my life? It's how do I become powerful in my life? So the, the, the point here is that if you want more, more self-confidence, you have got to come into a new relationship with the energy of doubt. When I start to renegotiate the relationship with my self-doubt in my life, it's going to rattle me. I would rather not think about it. I would rather not face it. You see? So in every moment, and this, I, I truly believe, and I've seen it, and I'm happy to talk about, give you examples from you know, patients or people I've worked with, Um, these horrible, horrible feelings that we spend our entire life trying to avoid, fear, doubt, anxiety, uncertainty, they are not here to punish us. They are a rite of passage. Mm. Uh, You are blowing us away with all kinds of wonderful and the counterintuitive uh, element of these insights is just mind bending. And we're, I'm really, really glad that we're having this conversation, Dr. Julia. The book is built around eight neuroenergetic codes. Right. And so let's talk a little bit about what a neuroenergetic code is. And so you might have to define what sort of what you mean by code. And let's talk a little bit about sort of what what can these do for us and, and, and how might we use them? Absolutely. So a neuroenergetic code is the idea of how can we. So the reason that I, I sort of came up with these codes is like it sort of depending on my mood, either tickles me or frustrates me. Like we pay more attention on how to operate our cell phones or chat GPT, then we pay attention to the operation of the most powerful machines in our possession, which is our brains, our brains and our nervous systems. So these neuroenergetic codes are eight principles, or I I like to call them blueprints for how to work with emotion. And it's broken down. So the first five codes are how do I work intelligently with my own emotions to really transform difficult things into rich opportunities, into empowerment, into confidence, into, and my synonym for emotional power is, is my wholeness, Mm. like my worthiness, my confidence, my resilience. So the, the first five are how to, how do I become more emotionally powerful in my life? And then the last three are, how do I think because relationships, all they are foundationally is a transaction of emotion for better and for worse, as we all know, right? So the, the last three codes are these blueprints or these principles about how to kind of work powerfully with other people's emotions, right? And, you know, what I think is really strong about energy rising is it's very practical. There's lots of examples. There's lots of exercises. It's not just this idea of like, this sounds good. It's like, how do we, where does the rubber actually hit the road? Yeah, you do a, lot, a really nice job in the book in bringing in examples and different things from eight, both your leadership work as well as your your more clinical work with the, the different people and kind of bringing in that real life example of those codes. It's interesting as you talk about that first five, you know, of of those neuroenergetic codes are about you know the the self and 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 how to understand those. And one of the pieces that that I took from that that you were talking about, and I I believe it was in the first code, if I remember expanding your power, I can't exactly remember exactly what it was, but it was about holding the shake. And I found that fascinating. And and you might need to do a little bit of background on this, but for our listeners, can you describe the concept of what holding the shake is and what 
what it does. Cause I thought that was really interesting and particularly the relationship to, to lifting weights. And I just, it was great. I'd be happy to. So one of the things that we have going for us is we have physical health, the idea of physical fitness and physical power and physical strength and the analog. And I know we kind of all know this intellectually, but the analog between physical power and emotional power, physical strength and mental strength is so strong. Okay. So if I want to get stronger physically, I'm just going to use the analogy first. And let's say I go to the gym. Okay. And right now I can only lift five pounds. Well, when I go to the gym and I'm like, I want to get stronger, I'm going to, for example, double it. I'm going to go up to 10. The first time I go to lift 10 pounds, I am not metaphorically, I am quite literally going to shake. So my muscles going to quiver, my heart's going to race, my I'm going my skin conductance is going to change meaning I might sweat. So there so my so my body is hitting this resistance. Now, never in the history of going to the gym has someone started to shake, started screaming, freaked out and ran from the gym never to return ever 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 again, right? In fact, and this is I think a really important piece. A lot of us who, you know, go for a walk or go for a run or go to the gym or go to a yoga class, we don't even necessarily like the sensation while we're shaking. We're like, make it stop. This is miserable in a way. But yet still, there's something satisfying because it's the shaking that is itself the clearest evidence of our expanding power. It's precisely the same on the emotional power side. And part of the reason I'm so willing to do the conversations like these is because watch what happens. Until we understand what's happening, if I go to have a conversation with someone, if I go to, when we, for example, are entrepreneurs or we're giving a presentation to a new client, even if we're not, you know, or we try to show up differently in our social network, there's a big degree of exposure. We feel anxious. Okay. So if we go to approach, I'll just, I'll just use public speaking. I'm happy to use any other example, but it's just so discreet. It's easy to wrap our minds around. So if I go and say, I'm going to give a, I'm going to do a Facebook live. Well, the first time I go to do a Facebook live, damn it, I'm going to shake. I'm, my hands are literally going to shake. My stomach's going to churn. My heart's going to pound. It's a lot of the same physical manifestations of the emotional energy. Well, if I didn't have a conversation like this and know what was happening, I would have every good reason to be like, oh, all that heart pounding and voice quivering and handshaking must be a sign of danger. So I should cancel this event. I should not launch this business. I should not have this conversation. And in that moment, when we avoid what feels like pain, what we're actually doing is avoiding the expansion of our life. So our life our, our, our nervous systems literally habituate to hold more emotional energy, more arousal when we test them, just like our muscles grow bigger when we test them. So the way I think about this is that we have this ability to be resilient that seems to be, uh, and, and we're, we are, human beings are remarkably resilient, but there's this uh, resilience in the physical world that is much more responsive and sort of stronger or easier to deal with than it is in the emotional world. Wh why is that? And say what you mean by easier, like people are just more willing yeah, to do it. Yeah, maybe it's just that people are more willing to do it, that we're more willing to invest in that shaking through the lifting 10 pounds uh, rather than shaking through the, I, you know, I'm not going to do that Facebook Live thing again. So... That's a fantastic question. There's sort of, I think, two really important elements to this. One is the biology and one is the culture. Mm. So one of the things that I'm on fire for is I have been at this work for, depending on how you want to look at it, 20 some years or 40 some years. So my, I come from, I'm only in, in my forties. I um, come from a lineage of psychologists. My dad's a psychologist. So I really grew up on this stuff. You know, I just always was drawn to it and his stories and his textbooks so it's been very interesting, very promising. I feel very optimistic to watch the evolution of the conversation on mental health and, and emotional, um, what I call emotional power. And it's really been, I think, accelerated in a lot of ways by the pandemic and then obviously the rise of technology. So I think we're having such deep conversations about these ideas of authenticity, about, you know, anxiety, about vulnerability. So I, I feel like as the conversation continues to change, 
I think people are going to be more willing to feel feelings they've historically avoided, just like maybe we're now more willing to go to the gym than we historically were. Okay, so I think part of it's when the culture changes, our relationship to emotional energy will evolve in ways yet unseen. Okay, the other piece of this that I, I, you know, I I have to do my due diligence is the way that emotions are, are emotions are really, I think, the fundamental bedrock of human existence. Right. So what what, the way this kind of bears out in the literature around pain is like, think of I'll just give you an example. So several years ago, I was trying to shut the my husband as a Prius. So I don't know. They're like like these little like I call like a little roller skate. You know, so it has like, right. We own one. I know. Yes. There you go. You you own one, too. I I did. We we no longer do. But yes, I I, I fully understand the roller skate. Okay. Yeah. So he had a bike rack on the trunk and the trunk's kind of curved. So I went to, you know, slam the trunk and I, can you see where this is going? I did not see the bike rack in my periphery. And I just, I mean, clobbered myself. Okay. So even when I tell that story now, I'm like, I don't feel it. I'm like, it sucked. I, one trial learning. I never, I never did that again, but like, I don't feel it like in my viscera. One time when I was 15 years old, I had to give a talk in social studies and I was very nervous to give the talk. And because of my anxiety, I'm even getting a little bit nervous to tell you guys yeah. this. Can you feel this? Yeah, I can hear it in your voice. I started, yeah. doing, I started doing this weird breathing thing. Like I couldn't rest. So I was like going <laughs> in front of a bunch of 15 year olds. Okay. So when I think about that, I still feel it. Like I still feel the embarrassment. I still feel the humiliation. All of that to say, there is something about emotional pain that gets stored in the human nervous system in a way that physical pain does not. Uh, All right. I'm going to dig in and and I'm going to apologize to our listeners right away. You're a neuroscientist on this, right? You're a neuropsychologist on this. What is it about that emotional pain that allows it to be reconsumed every time we think about it versus that physical pain that, yeah, I can remember breaking my leg, but I'm not like sitting there going, yeah. oh, my leg. Oh, I, I, you know, every time I do that, but looking back at a heartbreak or, you know, some other kind of thing like that, yeah. it, it does, you feel it. What, what is the, what's the, what's going on in our brain that, that makes that happen? Well, now you're getting into some like questions that I think a lot of us cognitive and affective researchers are trying to answer. No one has a perfect answer to that. In fact, if to be totally transparent, scientists do not even agree on what is emotion. There's a, there's a, you know, a lot of debate in, the, in a lot of sometimes contentious debate in the field about what is emotion. When you start to get into emotion, you start to get into existential questions. The meaning of our lives is rising on the energy of zing, zing, zap, zap, zoink, zoink. Like, that's both scientific and also pretty miraculous. And I think science is a miracle, okay? So these questions about who am I and what do I want, but you're precisely right. You are precisely right that emotional pain gets stored in the body in a different way than physical pain. And this is precisely at the extreme. And when I when I talk, you know, I, I, I'm very aware that I'm not talking to a clinical audience, but sometimes I will give clinical examples because if it's true at the most extreme form of the human experience, there's definitely power and wisdom for those of us who haven't experienced it as extremely. Trauma, here's another counterintuitive thing. Trauma is not what happened to us it's what happens to us. In other words, I was betrayed. I was traumatized in my childhood. And now I can never trust anyone ever again. I can never, I can never tolerate intimacy again. I'm constantly in the state of guarded vigilance. Well, the, tra- the war is over. But the, the whole idea of trauma, and this is, this is such an important p- part, piece to heal it, is the, the vigilance and the energy still lives in the nervous system until we really actively move it. Well, as you go to actively move it, if you have like a big sliver or a big piece of glass in your foot, as you go to do this really redemptive healing thing of mo- removing the glass from the foot, it, you're going to feel some things and they're not exactly great. But when you understand like birth, right? Mm. So like Birth, I, I mean, was not a pleasant experience, but you're, you're still, you're willing to, end, well, I mean, you have to endure because you know and you believe that there's something greater on the other side. 
Yeah, it, it, on the philosophical side, it reminds me of uh, Nietzsche's comment about uh, about having the why, right? There's sort of the uh, any why can get us through uh, almost any how. You know, beautiful. You know, beautiful. Um, and 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 it, 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 I felt that very much in in reading the book that that there is very much uh, about sort of a philosophical thing on top of all of this uh, very uh, important scientific foundation. There's kind of a philosophical mindset that that you're advocating is that is that fair absolutely you know i i believe that um when i said before like there's this intersectionality of of science and potentiality and so this idea i I actually think that science and faith are sisters Mm. and anyone who says science doesn't require a lot of faith and humility has never done science (laughs) we're not we're not like so i'm gonna um get a lot of money from the NIH and I am going to run all this experiments and recruit all of these participants and spend all this expensive money on these, you know, instruments because I already know the outcome. So science is a great venture into the unknown. And so we're we're constantly, and this is a big piece in energy rising, not the piece about science and faith, but about uncertainty. And, you know, to be powerful, we have got to renegotiate our relationship with certainty. This is something that's so like what's kind of happened is, you know, like in the age of enlightenment and, and with, the you know, now we're in the information age, we're obsessed with information. Well, you don't need to see the studies now to say like there's diminishing returns on how much information we get information logged, right? We get burnt out. We get so reactive. You know, there's like you're just bombarded with like crisis after crisis after cri- so or even not even necessarily like global crisis, but you just get like one too many emails from your boss or something. And you're like, oh my God, just make it stop. Right. So this idea that knowing perfect, knowing perfect achievement, perfect organization, perfect explaining, perfect, you know, I, in the book, I call these things, the overs, mm-hmm. like overworking, overdoing, over explaining, over giving, overthinking. This is all a pathological response, a disturbed relationship with certainty. I just actually, this kind of blew my own mind, but I wrote the essay in the Wall Street Journal for New Year's Eve. So it was incredible to sort of be able to sort of talk about this work in the Wall Street Journal now. But the the essay was about how when we're overachieving or overgiving or overworking or overthinking, what we're what's really happening is it's not a pleasure response because plenty of us enjoy thinking, plenty of us enjoy giving, plenty of us enjoy working. So where those those behaviors rise from the emotional energy of pleasure, overworking, overthinking, overgiving always rises from the emotional energy of fear. Well, what are we afraid of? The future we don't know. Mm-hmm. We've had, so until I go ahead. Oh, I was gonna. I was just gonna say we've had a, a number of guests on uh, over the past year who have talked about uncertainty. Arlie Kruginsky comes to mind. We've had a couple others, um, and and in those conversations, it is our our relationship with uncertainty that is being addressed. And I feel that you have a similar mode around uncertainty that, that we, we fear uncertainty when in fact we should be looking at uncertainty in a different perspective. Is, is that, am I uh, overstepping my interpretation of how you think about uncertainty? No, you're, you're perfectly, I think that's exactly on target. In fact, you know, when you think about Again, anxiety is on a continuum, okay? So um, I think this is going to make sense to people. It's like what anxiety, it's not that you have an, an anxiety disorder like PTSD or OCD or social anxiety or don't. It's that we all have anxiety on this kind of continuous scale. And then sometimes it gets to a point where it disturb, it profoundly disturbs function. And that's when we're now in sort of like diagnostic territory, okay? So it's important to understand that all this is happening on a continuum. Well, the best, the best definition and my work most kind of academically is focused on the anxious brain, what happens to us when we're anxious. So what happens, the the best definition I can give you for anxiety is that it is a disturbed relationship with certainty. So what happens, like take a disorder like OCD, what happens with OCD is people say, I'm not certain that the doors are locked, so I have to check. I'm not certain that the stove is off, so I have to check. 
I'm not certain that there's all different variants of OCD. You know, I'm not certain that my mother is still alive, so I have to call her again. Now, OCD is not psychosis. In other words, and part of the reason that, you know, all mental health disorders are very punishing in their own way, but one of the the real scourges of OCD is, is these people are saying, I don't know why I'm, I can't stop. I don't know why I'm doing this. Yeah. This is mad. I know I've checked the door. Please, God, don't make me check the door again. And then there I am checking the door again. Because what happens is I can't tolerate the uncertainty in my nervous system and the extreme so that I start to obsess. Then I have to compulse. In other words, I go check the door. That alleviates my anxiety for a brief period of time. And what happens when we're not intelligent, and this is, again, why I'm on fire for emotional power, is you don't have a choice, really. In other words, if I start to say, well, I'm just going to like, I'm only checking the door. This is a metaphor. I'm only checking the door five times today. I can deal with that. <laughs> it's going to grow. Anxiety is a progressive dis- di- like energy of contagion. I get more anxious and more anxious and more anxious. And the only antidote to that, the re- you really have two choices. I'm either going to work so hard in my life, I'm going to try to ensure these external forms of certainty. In other words, if I work enough or give you enough, I'm people pleasing enough to you, then then therefore I will be safe. Well, it sounds in those examples like the opposite. Are you guys still with me or am I going too no, fast? No, you're going good. Okay. So it sounds like the, so the human brain has an allergy to uncertainty. This is There's no, the the reactivity to uncertainty is neurobiological because the brain is a pattern detector. The brain is moving you through life going apple, 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 fill in the blank. Well, I predict it should be an apple or maybe today it's going to be a banana. But the one thing I cannot tolerate if I'm an organ in the business of predicting what comes next is not knowing. Okay. So uncertainty is we're allergic to it. Got it. Okay, fine. Well, then it's like, well, how then in a world, I mean, the future, a synonym for the future is, I don't know, like, I literally don't know what comes next. Okay. So in a, in a world where we're moving through space and time in this way, I have two responses to uncertainty. I can try to make things certain, i.e. I start overworking, over asking, over explaining, over engineering. And it sounds, until we have conversations like these, this is another counterintuitive point, that the opposite of uncertainty should be certainty. Linguistically, opposite of uncertainty sounds like certainty. No. Because the more you pathologically and aggressively seek certainty, the more anxious you're actually going to become. You guys with me? Yeah, 100%. Okay. So then what is the opposite? What is the opposite of uncertainty? The opposite of uncertainty is self-trust. It is the idea that whatever happens out there, I don't know, and I'm going to be okay. So it's trust in self, trust in God, however you understand God to be, what universe, laws, whatever. And then on, on some level, trust in other. But here's the other problem. I know like I'm, I'm dropping a lot right now. How in the world, this is the piece like we, I think it's amazing that we're having all these conversations about psychological safety. But how in the world is, am I going to be able to trust somebody else if I can't trust myself? Tell me how to make that meaningful. And even on the days when the people around me are trustworthy, I am on borrowed time (laughs) because I know if you have a bad day or you leave me or you get sick, I'm up shit's creek. Excuse my language. So the call to emotional power is a, is, is a call. it, It is a homecoming. So let's say that you decided to take a month to refuel your fire, your passion for emotional power, and you went to a desert island and you were able to take two artist catalogs with you. Who would you take with you? Who would I take with me? I would take the Eagles greatest hits and I would probably take August and everything after Counting Crows. There's just so much nostalgia in both of those for me. That those are fantastic. Yeah. You you could take all of the eagles, by the way, all oh, their songs, awesome. all their songs, all, of, all the and, counting crows. If 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 you felt like I would, yes, would. I would. would. Okay, thank you. Okay, that, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> um, we, we had a recent guest who who said, "I'm we're taking. I, I'll take the Rolling Stones until." Uh, who <laughs> until Ronnie new, Wood joins. Until Ronnie band. Wood joined, and then I'm taking. We're going. Well, you could take those and just not listen to them. No. 
don't even want him on the island with him. So, <laughs> you know, maybe we That's were fun. just wondering, you know, maybe you just want the Eagles greatest hits. You don't want to listen to any of their other work. So, you know, yeah. 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 I'll take it all. It's always good to have more than you need, right? Yeah, I mean, that's it's kind of like, all right, classical economi- it, economics, it, right? It limits yeah. that uncertainty right for the future, right? No. There we go. There we go. See? <laughs> <laughs> what if I might want to listen to the B yeah. side of, yeah. you know, yeah. One of these nights, yeah. yeah. Um, Dr. Julia DeGangi, thank you so much for being a guest on Behavioral Groups today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a wonderful conversation. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I share ideas on what we learned from our discussion with Julia, have a free-flowing conversation, and groove on whatever else comes into our energy rising brains. There it is. There it yeah. is. That's energy rising brains. Energy yeah. rising. Yeah. It's um it, it's good. It's it, I think it's a great premise for the book and maybe more importantly, it was just a really fun conversation with Julia. It was a really fun conversation. And do you think that your brain has energy that's rising <laughs> at this moment. You know, I'm probably flat out. I'm flatlining. <laughs> You're flatlining. Yeah, I, wish my, right I wish my energy was rising. I really do. And I think there's a important piece of, of that as we kind of look at what's going on in, in our world and different things. We were talking about this before we got on, you know, there's so much stuff going on. And I think what Julia talks about here is really important because, you know, this idea of emotions, our energy is really key and that those emotions can enhance or drain that piece. So, yeah. 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 She reminds us that emotions are just emotions, right? They're, they aren't, they really aren't good or bad. We can have positive or negative emotions, but emotions themselves are just emotions but they and they're really important because they help us process the experiences of the world right that it's a it's a shortcut for is this a good idea or a bad idea when we have an emotional response it kind of indicates to us well we might be heading into something that's good or maybe heading into something that's not so good so emotions are a great shortcut so let's use them but i think what i really liked about Julia's comments is that she's saying let's let's put the right frame on them and use them in a in a positive way in our lives to enhance our our life experience. Right. And this idea that avoiding our feelings ends up dividing our emotional energy from our behaviors. And that's a that's a fruitless exercise, right? <laughs> there's there's this piece that it's like, oh, you can't avoid feelings. And I think it's really important that, you know, one way or another, we're going to have an emotional response. That's yeah. just, it's yeah. given, right? right? That is, right. that's how we're wired. This is the world that we live in. You know, we are not Spock, right? Yeah. We are not totally rational things. We have emotional responses. Yeah. And our oppor- opportunity comes when we process those emotions and how we frame them, as you said, and whether we use them to build something up or to tear something down. Yeah, both both are opportunities kind of with every I- emotional encounter that we have. I, I loved it when she talked about the Facebook Live presentation example, mm-hmm. right? This whole idea that it, if we're getting ready to do it for the first time, we've got these this bundle of anxious uh, feelings and stress and all kinds of stuff going on. And our bodies are processing that as this is dangerous. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, you know, and because it's the first time. And yet, if if we go back to it, if we practice, if we do it more than one time, we have many Facebook live presentations, we just become more relaxed because we become more familiar. And it's of course, it's in, it, it's really not dangerous at all. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, we have the, right this idea that uncertainty and risk are processed in the same way from an emotional perspective, right? Our, the, our brains don't understand the difference when our body reacts. And I love this idea that our bodies have a very limited vocabulary. Yeah, right? yeah. Our heartbeats increase, our um, breathing gets shallower or deeper. You know, we start to sweat, right? There are There's only a limited number of of responses that we have from an emotion. And so to process that information, 
in other words, to our brains are going, ooh, heartbeat's rising, our breath is getting shallower, we're doing this, oh, that's risk. That's this, this one. In fact, it's no, it's just uncertainty. I've never done this before. Yeah. I'm not going to die. There's no risk involved outside of maybe, you know, feeling like I didn't do the best job I could. I mean, my God, we do that all the time on this show, you know, <laughs> every, every day. <laughs> I yeah. love that. I, I, I love that. That's, that's actually a, a great example. I'm, I also think that, you know, I, I was thinking about you, you were skiing last week and we, you know, and I was just thinking that if if you want to start exercising, Julia talks about this idea of working incrementally. Like when mm -hmm. I started my first time I was on a ski hill, I didn't take the lift to the top of the mountain and just, you know, stare down the steepest runs. I, what? So I started on. Oh, you did probably. But no, but man, <laughs> let's go out. I'll take you to the top. Here we go. I we're going down the double black. We're going to hike up. We're going to go up. We're going to hike and we're going to go down some shoots and then we're going to hit some, you know. Yeah, no, not, not, <laughs> not even after all the years that I've been skiing. No, thank you. But, I, but we start on bunny on the bunny hill. Yes. Right? So if you're start, if you're thinking about, well, how can I get better? It's not about a day and night shift of I'm going to make this dramatic improvement in my life. Just overnight, snap my fingers, read the book, bottle of bing. I'm all better. No, it's like, Work, it's like working out or starting a, a new skill. Start incrementally. You, are, that was a, one of the best analogies, right? Is yeah. that what it, it meant? Yeah. It's an analogy, not a metaphor, right? That was great. Yeah. Where did you, like, man. Well, every now I am and just, then. I am in awe right now, Mr. Houlihan. I am in awe. The bunny hill to the greens to the blues to the blacks to the double black diamonds to hiking up and going, back you know, country. Uh, back country, skiing through avalanches. There we go, man. We're going to go do this. There we go. We're, we're going to go up there. We're going to, we're going to do some back country emotional, uh, uh risk, work risk here. Taking. Yeah. Um, okay. But we have to start. We have to start at the bunny hill. We That's have to move to the green and the blue. We have to get practice. We have to improve how we do it so that when we do face those black diamonds, that we have the skill set to be able to do that. Right? Yeah. You know, it, it also reminds me of a, a recent experience. I know a bunch of people who have um, been laid off for the first time. And, and there's a bunch of people in their 20s who this is their first job that they're being rift right the, right the, the the workforce reduction is happening for the first time for them and they're freaking out and yeah. you know i'd like to say look at your life maybe you've never been laid off before but you've been through other challenging situations and you were resilient right right you're still here you're you're you know you're still fogging a mirror and you're able to get through the day after many challenging situations have happened. Yeah. So I, I just want to, you know, encourage people to connect with their, their resilience on yeah. other factors that might lead to, you know, today. And, and again, fogging the mirror. What a great, what a great term. There you go. We're <laughs> fogging the mirror. I'm still here. <laughs> still fogging that mirror. If you put it in front of my, 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 my thing, but there's an interesting piece, right? So let's go going back to the the skiing analogy. Okay, I knew when you'd like that. Oh. I, I do. That's I, I'm I'm gravitating towards it. The idea that all right, if you're starting off and you're going down that bunny hill or those green runs to begin with, there are skill sets that you might have had. You know, if it's it's balance, it's understanding gravity, it's riding a bike, different pieces along those lines that you can use. It's water skiing, other types of activities that you've done that help you that aren't skiing, but have oh, yeah. elements that can help you. So somebody, and, and again, it's like the idea I've taught skiing, right? For many years. And there's a difference between teaching four, five-year-olds than teaching eight, nine-year-olds. Oh, right? really? That is. And and I mean, there's some interesting pieces because some of it is just like the the four or five-year-olds, there's not much fear and, and they're lower gravity to the ground and different pieces, but they don't necessarily have the muscle control 
that an eight, nine year old does. Interesting. Right. Those eight, nine year olds or the or the mental capacity to listen to me drone on and on and on about pointing your skis down and, you you know, doing different pieces. We just have to go out and do stuff and we 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 progress and they're, you know, great. But eight, nine year olds pick it up a lot faster. Hmm. Right. Hmm. They are able to do some things, although there is an emotional component to that where they're more scared often, right? It's like, I, oh, yeah, this is, this is scary. I don't want to do that. So for those that can overcome that part, they have some of the other requisite skills required to be a fast learner at skiing versus maybe somebody that isn't. Anyway. That's interesting. That I find that really interesting. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled uh, discussion. <laughs> what, we're not talking skiing here? This isn't a, a ski show? Hey, guys. All right. Uh, the, yeah. the, the second thing that I wanted to, to talk about was how our emotional pain is not adaptive like physical pain. This, this evolutionary thing I thought was a really interesting thing that Julia pointed out. And this idea that if we think about emotional pain as being, oh, I got, I got burned in a bad relationship, that sticks with us for a long time. Whereas if we burn our hand on the stove, we learn from it. Like we, we re, you know, first of all, the pain heals, it goes away. Literally the pain goes away, yeah. but we have this learning now that we carry for the rest of our life. But emotional pain, like we carry the emotional baggage. We, you know, we talk about it as baggage, but we carry the emotional pain with us for a long time. And that's, and that really sucks, I think. Um, and we don't it, necessarily learn. I mean, how many times <laughs> have we seen people, our friends, ourselves, uh, loved ones, who continue to date that wrong person, right? All right, we had a horrible relationship. They got out of it and you're going, great. And then the very next month, they're like back with another person and you're going, they're just like the last person. Why yeah. are you doing this? Right, right. 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 Yeah, yeah. I, I have seen that. <laughs> uh, and I think there might be something about this that has to do with, with sort of two important components. Um, that sort of serve as boundaries. We've got our genetic code, our genetic operating system, if you will, and the environment that we grew up in. And those those things kind of set boundaries or have an influence on our ability to process all this stuff. So, yeah. so something that I think about Julia's book um, and and her comments is that there are going to be limits to what we can do, but she is really good at promoting the idea that we can just do better. We can sort of maximize the experience that we have, maximize the the genetic code that we're born with and the environment that we grew up with, and let's just make the most out of it. Yeah. I mean, you, you look at like Bowlby talking attachment theory and all of those from the late 60s, early 70s, and how that rewires the brain early on and what that does for long-term success and a variety of other things. But what they showed is that, yeah, that's a that's a downer to have that like if you weren't didn't feel attached as a child. But that doesn't mean that that is a life sentence. You can work on that. You can change that. You can make that better. And I think that's a really important piece. And I think that's what Julia is saying here is this idea that we can and often should just take that incremental step. And if yeah. you do, it's the old analogy that I, I, I don't know if I took it from Tony Robbins or who from, I don't know what. You One know. of the great, it was either Tony Robbins or Marcus Aurelius, probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this idea that we often think that we need to change and we need to, if we're going down this, this road, that we need to do a 90 degree turn and just go a totally separate direction. And that's really hard. You can't do that, but you can make increment, you can change you know, 1%, you can shift your direction by 1%, not yeah. too hard, you know, half a percent, and then another 1%. Right. And if you do that enough, you know, over time, it's the, it's the learning on the, on the ski hill. Once again, here, Tim, we're back right? You skiing. study at the, or you start at the bunny hill and then you progress to the green, blues, and blacks, mm -hmm. right? This idea of small learning changes are what drive really making long-term change um, uh, something that happens. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. Okay. How about if we wrap up with some of her fantastic meme worthy one liners? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I think we, we definitely make need to make sure that this goes out on social media, that there is going to be a whole bunch of these. Cause maybe, maybe one person will actually like it then, you know, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe two, maybe two, two, maybe, Who maybe, knows? maybe we'll get a share. How about that? Crazy, oh crazy. Now I you're... know we're we're just uh, we're going. Uh, besides you and me, which is always what ends up happening is oh, like, I was... oh, yeah, you shared it, I shared it. There we go. Woohoo! We got two shares. That's what I was <laughs> hoping for that you and I would share and that we would <laughs> have, have a share in the original <laughs> post. Okay, all what, right. What all was right. one of your favorites? Um, there is nothing in your life that has meaning until you have feelings about it. Ah, yeah. There is nothing in your life that has meaning until you have feelings about it, Tim. Nothing. That is that fantastic? Oh my god, oh, that's such yeah. a that is such a great line. Okay, how about how about we're dividing the energy of our emotion from the energy of our behavior? <gasps> dun, 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 dun. Wow, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. So mentioned this up at the beginning, right? A disturbed relationship with certainty. Oh, man. Isn't that A great? disturbed relationship with certainty. I have a disturbed relationship with certainty. Oh, me too. I it, When she said that, oh, God, I felt like it was a lightning rod being thrust right through the top of my brain. It was just like, oh, I, I absolutely give in to that. Oh, okay. Uh, speaking of brains, how about this one? The brain has an allergy for uncertainty. <laughs> Oh, at you, at you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is. Oh, my God. All right. Yeah. Giving comes from joy. Overgiving comes from fear. Bing. Bada boom. Wow. Over that's not giving. Chicago, though. We just did New Jersey thing there with the bada boom. Oh, Sorry. We should have done a Chicago thing. Uh, <laughs> the Bears. Yeah, there you go. The Bears. Uh uh, yeah, but overgiving comes from fear. Oh, that's just like neuroses right there. It is. And it it what I love about these is that they are just this capture so much in mm -hmm. so little. Yeah. Kind of yeah. like you, Tim. Kind of like you. <laughs> so much wrapped up in just this tight little such a small little brain. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going there, but uh, yeah. All right. And, and all right, I, last one, last one. I, I, do I one have, more. Yeah, I have to reiterate that that um that one about about uh, the off ramps where she said that chronically missing the off ramps can lead to better emotional health. Yeah. That oh that would lead you know the, so the idea is we're missing the off ramps that would make life better. Yeah. Like we're on, you know, we get into this status quo bias thing of always thinking, oh, I, I'm just going to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'd like to do something different, but right now I'm really busy, so I, I can't really change. And so I'm going to stay on the highway to hell <laughs> rather than take the off ramp that could actually make my relationship better, my work better, yeah. things like that. Oh, yeah. Chronically missing the off ramps that can lead to better emotional health. Yeah. Well, you just mentioned highway to hell, right? Yep. ACDC. Bon, ACDC. Mm -hmm. Bon Scott, lead singer for that album, wrote yep. that song, mm -hmm. um, died from drinking too much, puking and suffocating on his own puke. He did not get off that damn off ramp on his highway to hell. <laughs> Wow. There you go. First, you just, okay, that was just masterful. You brought in music, music, you know, you got a little trivial with who wrote the song, tied that to his death. Way to go, Kurt. Wow. <laughs> you know what? With that, we're ending it because okay. I, I can't, I can't <laughs> okay. improve anything beyond that. Sound, sound okay? Okay. Yeah, it does actually. Okay. I just, I do just want to say that Julia had maybe, Possibly the most meme worthy quips of any guest we've ever had. Is is that fair to say? That's, I, I, that's I just think she was amazing. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. And and we are grateful she wrote the book she did and shared her time with us to talk about it. And of course, we want to remind you, in case you haven't already checked it out, you need to listen to that five part series on the history of behavioral economics. And what's it called, Tim? What's it called? They thought we were ridiculous. <laughs> 
<laughs> they thought we were ridiculous. <laughs> it's 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 live right now, so you can just like line it up. There you go. Yeah, because you know, here's here's the. Here's the why. It's it's more than just a story about a bunch of really smart people deciding that neoclassical economic theory wasn't always cracked up to be. It, I think that the the underlying story that we're telling here is that it's about what it's like to build a movement, like a whole new way of thinking about our lives and how we make decisions. It's it's more than just about tenacity to do th- something. It's it's also the story about how you give people time to marinate in their own juices, or new ideas, and in order for really innovative stuff to float to the top. You know, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think the series really puts perspective on how good science, that is the scientific findings that take hold of our lives and last for generations, well, it takes time to do good science, yeah, right? It takes yeah. time to make that. And we live in a world where it feels like speed is everything. You know, pop stars are made overnight. Big companies run sprints to make their quarterly numbers for Wall Street. But in this series, we discover a bunch of people who took dozens of years and thousands of hours of conversations and walks and yeah. sitting together in, in rooms to plow through some important ways we view the world and how we make decisions about it. And that's pretty amazing uh it is um so that's our why you that's why we want all of our groovers to check out all five episodes but right now we hope that you reflect on our conversation with dr deganji and the way that she challenges us to build up our emotional power and to build resilience by focusing the energy in our lives and we hope that her ideas on how to deal with our emotions become a little like acorns for growth this week as you go out and find your groove. <laughs>